Okay, so well, let's start. Just in, in general, I have a feeling that I lost you. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's how far that feeling is correct. So let, let me try to say, summarize roughly where we are and what we're trying to do or, or not. <laughs> so maybe some strip a long, long time ago, we were trying to quantize maybe Poisson Lee groups. And we actually already did it. I, well, we did it only as quantization of a Poisson manifold, not, not we didn't produce a Hopf algebra, but if you remember, we, there was this statement and on, on G when this is a Poisson group, there is action of, of the Dreamfeld double that, that came from just imagining this as D mod G star, at least locally. And so then what we could do, we, well, we took the algebra, which is a, that's an algebra, you know, in the, uh, in the category of representations of D, And so, and this guy is infinitesimally commutative algebra in this category of UD mod. It was the thing. So, which implies that the same algebra with the same product, with the same unit, is also a, a, just a commutative algebra. The same thing is a commutative algebra in this Dreamfeld's category. Right, so um, it's the same category as that one. It, it even has the same tensor product of everything. It only there is a new braiding, so in place of the symmetry there is a braiding here, and there is this associativity constant, rebracketing is now something difficult coming from the associator, but otherwise it's the same thing. The statement is that this guy with the same product, with the same unit, stays a commutative algebra here because it is I commutative. So it satisfies this additional thing. This additional thing is that when you take the product, uh, before taking product, when you act by T, then this is zero. Okay, so therefore, commutative or not, but certainly what is important here for the moment is that it's associative. It is an algebra. If it were not of this type, then the same product would not help us. It would, it would not stay associative, at least not in general. And so for, for what we can do from here, we can take two copies of the thing, maybe complete it or something. So now this guy being tensor product of two algebras is an algebra. And associative, whenever I say algebra, it means associative. Algebra in the Dreamfeld's category. In UD mod H bar phi. But now somehow, you know, you know, being associative in this category that means something relatively difficult because well, associative means what we have A tensor A tensor A that either we take the product here first, right, so we take, go to A tensor A with what with M tensor identity or we take the product first. Second two slots, and then we take the product. So the statement is that this commutes this diagram, and there is this stupid arrow wh where we are acting with phi, and that's a difficult thing in principle or whatever. This phi is a thing that we prefer not to think about maybe, and so we have some strange product on functions on G times G, which is associative in this sense, not in the ordinary sense. But we want to get a true associative, ordinary associative product, so, and, and not on G times G, but on G. So what do we do? We just mod out by G. So the thing that we do here, 
we take this, we just take the G invariant, or rather, we take G invariant functions, where this G epsilon G times G by what? The thing. So, on nature, we can identify this simply with the infinity of G say, as a vector space where, like, it's the uh, ideology is that uh, if, uh, he would be talk talking about function, where well, a function here, just of one element, would become a function here of two elements of this form G1 inverse G2. And so G invariant functions are exactly functions of this form, meaning they are exactly functions there. And but the statement is, once we take this G invariant part, then, well, all this uh, high broad description was that taking G invariant part is a uh, flux monoidal functor from this Dreamfields category to the category of vector spaces, but what it really means for us that on the gene variant part, this, this, phi, this phi action just is just nothing. It's just identity. That's it. So on this, on this stuff, that product that we constructed here is a true associative product in the sense of vector spaces. And that's it, our star product. Why is phi trivial? Because we proved it. Uh, and what he, what he proved, uh, there was a statement that's going from uh, so we're going from UD mod to vect where to x we assign g invariant part. This is a symmetric monoidal functor. or lex monoidal functor. How, uh, how, is it, uh, how is it monoidal in what sense? So you take x tensor y. Oh, uh, it's, it's the other way, sorry. So we take x and g invariant part tensor y and g invariant part. That's certainly a subspace of of these invariants. So, so these are things which are invariant under both actions. These are things which are invariant only under the diagonal action. Certainly, that's a subspace. And this is our mono, this is the monoidal structure on this functor. Okay, this functor is monoidal in this way, in this very easy way. There is nothing strange quantumish happening here, right? So this thing, so it's a symmetric monoidal functor. Okay, who cares? But what is important that it is also I-braided. So let me call this F. So F is, this is monoidal, monoidal structure on F is this thing, and F is I braided. And this is a thing that we proved, and it's not so, it's not so difficult ju just because, or Just when you, uh, when you imagine w what's happening with, with action of T on this guy when we restrict ourselves to, to those invariant things, then this action of T is going to just disappear. The reason why it disappears is because this T is something like EI tensor EI plus EI tensor EI. So, so when we act with this guy on uh, say on uh, x tensor y in x tensor y. Imagine that, well, we're acting with this on that and with this on that, and plus acting with this on, on that and this on that. But if, if those, both of those things are actually G invariant, then, okay, this is a basis of, this basis of G, 
This is basis of G star. G star is going to act non-trivially, but G is going to act trivially on, on invariance. Right? So, so if, if actually X tensor Y is in XG tensor YG, so in this case, this action of then T acting on X tensor Y is simply zero. Right, so this guy is somehow I braided in, so it's not just symmetric, but it's also compatible with this first order deformation of the symmetry to the braiding, which implies that when you pass to the corresponding Driefeld categories, when you actually use that associator, put there those H bars, then the same F with the same uh, monoidal, uh, monoidal structure just stays braided. So this implies F from uh, UD mod H by phi to invect. There, there is no, uh, no deformation of the, or T is equal to zero invect. So I'll just write H bar. So this guy is uh, is braided monoidal with the same, mono, just with this monoidal structure. Nothing else. Being here somehow braided does, for this argument, braided doesn't matter, but the, this is the only way how to get them something monoidal. We're getting it as braided monoidal. So what's important, it's monoidal. That it means that it sends algebras to algebras. F of an algebra is and that's all. That's, that's what's happening here. You can also try to think some about it directly. So why, why is it true that in this particular case, when, when, it, when I restrict myself to those invariants, why it is true that this action of, of phi is going to disappear, why it's, why it's only one that contributes? But it's the same argument. In the end, it's going to be the same argument as here because that phi has in, it, in itself T12 and T23. So either T12 is going to act or either T23 is going to act, but it's always going to act on something invariant. And okay, then I'll let you finish. So, but what you're doing now, we're trying to, okay, we already say found the algebra, just found the star product. So what, what you want to do now, and I was doing it in a very conceptual and therefore completely incomprehensible way, uh, is how to make it to a Hopf algebra, not just to an algebra, but to a Hopf algebra. So we want to really deform, deform the infinity of G as a algebra or this duality. We can talk about it deforming, deforming or the enveloping algebra of G. So this is in some sense more general because here this G might be infinite dimensional, might be over any field of characteristic zero, etc. This is a Lie group. But then on the other hand, this is geometric. So this is somehow fo in a formal neighborhood of identity, roughly speaking, on what's happening. But any of those are okay. And then I started to talk about how to get a Hopf algebra in the first place. And that's where, where I had the feeling that I was still, possibly the feeling was wrong, but I mean, or possibly I lost, lost myself. <laughs> so 
L let me try to find us. Let's see what's happening. So there, there was this kind of, in general, idea is that the, the most general idea is that the Hopf algebra is sort of something like a group. Whatever that means. Of course, it doesn't mean anything. But then, it, uh, the next idea is that to take any uh, understanding of a group and try to make it, in some sense, non commutative so that it would now, in the end, spit out a, a Hopf algebra. And we took one of the possible ways how to, how to do it. So, so let's say idea prime was, I was, I was using simplicial sets. So let me now try to say the same thing, but without simplicial sets and without simplicial objects, just, just say, say on the, in the, very, in the, the simplest examples what was happening. So the idea is something like this, that if, if say, if G is a group, then in terms of those simplicial sets, I was talking about BG, and which is also equal to EG and when we modify out by G, something like that. But say for the smallest n's that might appear here, so what, what, what is happening here? So that BG thingy is roughly speaking, when we look at what was B2G, somehow two dots connecting and co connecting our edge, then we would just draw a G here. So this was just equal to G. And then we looked at, one might look at how things on a triangle. So imagine that you have G, H, and here you have G, H. So all possible triples in, all possible triples in G, where this is G, that's H, and this is their product. So this kind of thing, of course, characterizes, characterizes the product in the group, I imagine. So if you imagine that, well, okay, so this is the picture for, this is the picture for B, 3G. And one way how to get here, is what, what is happening here. So imagine that now I start drawing elements of the group at the vertices. So we have just this, but then I mod it out by G, by the, by the joint action of G. So in other words, this is G times G modulo G, where this action is the same as uh, was once written somewhere. The uh, diagonal action on the left, just multiplication on the left. So this thing one can naturally identify with just simply with G. And how do I, how do I do it? I just, well, I just sends G0 and G1 to G0 inverse G1. And so, so who's this element? That's the element who, who is needed for going from G0 to G1. So you need to multiply that by this to get to G1. Not very surprising, right? But then we looked at what's happening finally with this three thing. So just imagine we have G0, G1, G2. So this would be E3, G, oh sorry, oh, I am, no, I made a mistake. This is B1, this is B2, okay, it's okay. It's like this. Yes, E2 is G cube, so we put, we're putting a copy of G at each of those vertices. But then we mod out by the action of G. 
And what, what can I, what can I say, no, one say? We have from this E to G modulo G, we have three maps. Three maps going to just E one G modulo G in the G cube modulo G, you know, those three maps. One to G squared modulo G. So what are those maps? It's just ignoring one, erasing one of those vertices right? or looking what, what's happening at an edge. So like G0, G1, G2, the class of that will be sent to either the class of G0, G1 or the class of G1, G2 or the class of G0, G2. Those are those three maps. Not very surprising. And now, uh, how do I how do I finally use it? It's just a statement that <coughs> this gives us a bijection between e two g. Modulo G. This is bijection when it when it using just the map one and map two. One, one two. So we remember what's happening here and what's happening there. And but but we have a, also a third map going to G. And that's the product. Uh, I probably made it even more confusing than last time, right? Okay. <laughs> because our, what do we do? So here is the zero, one, two. Yeah, I'm, I'm just basically saying that, that this stuff is the same as this picture on, 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 it, on it this thing, right? So when we model by the action of G, then we need to remember how to get from each vertex to each vertex, by which we need to multiply. But then there is a re relation that for going from here to there is the same as jumping like that. And that's why this thing remembers the product. Okay. Okay, so. In case it was even more confusing than last time, then take what happened last time. And then we took this idea and finally produced some theorem. And uh, to continue in this tradition, I'll try to make it even more confusing than last time. Theorem is about construction of Hopf algebras. And so last time I formulated it using very much those simplicial objects. Now I'll try to just extract the, the needed part. So just to get, get the Hopf algebra. So it's the, the theorem that we already saw, but only stated in more down to earth terms, if you wish. So what we need. So suppose. That uh, D and C are braided monoid categories. And Q, an object of D, is a co commutative co algebra. And finally, we need a braided co monoidal functor. So S 
from D to C, I braid it to a monoidal functor. And then there is this technical assumption that F is what I call uh, Q admissible. Which is supposed to that, that F should kill one Q. So what 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 is it? I can only write it down. What what that thing what that thing means? It means that when we take any x y in our D, and now look at what happens with F of x. Y. Uh, so what we can do, we can apply inside the coproduct on Q to get to F X Q Q Y. And then we're using that F is commonoidal. We go to F X Q F Q Y. So what, what and the the thing means that this is supposed to be an isomorphism. So having one f and one q is supposed to be the same as having two f's and two q's. And there is one more uh, just side condition in this admissibility, which is that if you take f just of Q that we are going to get one. So how do we get there? So we first apply the co-unit. We get to one in D. And then again, we just use the fact that it's commonoidal, that F is commonoidal to get to one in C. And then we suppose that this is an isomorphism. So how should I imagine this Q is supposed to be like our, this G? Every time you see it's Q, imagine it's G. Every time you see F, you imagine that it's a modulo G, modeled by the action of G. And the outcome is that then, F Q Q, who sits in C, is a hot algebra. And what exactly is this hop structure there? Say the co as a co-algebra. What is it? Just simply Q. Uh, Q is a co-algebra, therefore, so Q tensor Q. That's a coalgebra in, uh, in D. And so that implies also that F of Q, Q coalgebra in, in, in C. And how, how exactly was happening precisely? So this Q, Q thing, how is it a coalgebra? We take two Qs. Now take the coproduct here take the coproduct on the other copy, and we need to exchange them. So we, we use the braiding. That's how Q, Q is a coalgebra. And how is F of Q, Q a coalgebra? Well, we take F of that, meaning F of Q, Q. Then we apply this thing. So it, we go to F of Q, 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 Q. We ended up here. But then we use that F is commonoidal, so then we can split it somehow. So this is the coproduct. Maybe there's a way how to draw it. If I draw F as this kind of stuff. 
not sure whether it's helpful, but, but this is what's happening, right? So uh, I put it all under F. So here is just uh, happening the, under the functor F. And here I apply the, this commonoidal thingy of which is on F, so it's some sort of coproduct which splits it this way. So that's what happened. Okay, and the co-unit. It's just again the same thing. So, so this guy is a co-algebra, so we can apply the co-unit. So we just take epsilon q, epsilon q. We go to f11, who is who is one, and then go to uh, you know, d one and c. You're using that f is common idle uh, But how is it an algebra? So f sorry f Q, Q, so this thing is extra extracted from this simple shell structure or this sort of simple shell objects, but let me put it this way. So we need to find the product. So what is the product? We need to find the product from F, Q, Q, F, Q, Q. And the idea is to use this isomorphism for x and y equal to q. So, yeah. So this guy is isomorphic to that guy, so if you wish, I'll draw Q, 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 this, where this arrow is uh, well, F of identity tensor epsilon Q tensor identity. But what's important is that this is an, this is an isomorphism. That's what we suppose there. Therefore, we can invert it, right? We can go the other way. Delta, yeah. But it's very close in alphabet. So. Yeah, so we apply this delta thingy. And what is the arrow going this way? It seems that there is finally epsilon. This is, you remember once there was this, this confusing thing which I, uh, which, I've now, which I now erased. So imagine you have those 0, 1, 2, and if you erase that thing, you're going to get oh, 1G. If you erase that thing, you're going to get this H thingy. But if you erase that thing, you're going to take, get uh, this H, uh, the G times H here. So we're going to erase this middle thing. So what is that stuff? This is uh, identity, or F under identity, uh, epsilon identity. So that's the definition of the product. And the product is when you invert this isomorphism and then apply, then erase this middle Q using, using the coinit. Uh, is it all? I probably still need to say what is the unit. Beyond, I uh, should. Uh, the, let's say I'm here saying that it's coalgebra, then uh, they start saying that it's an algebra, and then I would need to say, well, this is antipode, but I will, of course, forget, so thanks anyway. So the unit, that's when you go from F, Q to F. Q, Q, using the coproduct, and this is isomorphic with one in C. That, that was one of those two conditions on, on this Q uh, admissible functor, 
So there was the statement that this guy is isomorphic to that guy via how did it go close to f of 1 in the, and the thing, that this composition is an isomorphism. OK, that's it. And the antipode. So, so that, that's, as, that's this thing as an algebra and the antipode. So as to itself is simply f of beta. Okay. Where does this thing come from? It's just Im uh, imagining that you have this the thing. So how do we get the inverse? We need to flip it. Right, so there is some element of G going that way. To get this inverse, we just exchange those things and we get the inverse. OK, so let me now prove again. I think I didn't prove this antipode part uh, last time, but uh, so let's also get to this antipode part. But th there was some simple uh, something argument for why everything works. But uh, but let's just uh, let's just have a look at some these low level details of what's happening when it's described this way. So first of all, uh, certainly FQQ is a coalgebra. There is no problem, right? That we already, I, I wrote it that, that way. It's just the image of a coalgebra under a commonoidal functor, definitely a coalgebra. Now, the second, th uh, no. second thing would be probably uh, proving that, uh, that it's also an algebra. But uh, let me first get to the easier thing, which is proving that the product in the algebra is compatible with the, with the coproduct. So M is a morphism of, of coalgebra. So that's one of the that's compatible bit between product and coproduct is this thing. And why is this? One needs to have a look at what's happening here. See, M is defined as a composition of this with that. Now, so in, in this, there, there, are, there is this strange map containing delta Q. So it, it, it uses two things. First of all, that delta Q going from Q to Q tensor Q is a morphism of coalgebras, and why is it? Who knows why it's a morphism of coalgebras? Uh, no, it's exactly co-commutativity. It, it's uh, or maybe it's easier to think of it in the dual, just in the ordinary wor world, and when you dualize it. So, is uh, when you have an algebra. Is the map from A tensor A to A given by the product? Is it a morphism of algebras? No. Because A, B, C, D is not equal to A, C, B, D. But if the algebra is commutative, then yes. Because A, B, C, D is equal to A, a C, B, D. So this is true because Q is co-commutative. So that's, that's this arrow. This is, a, this, is a morph, this is a morphism of coalgebras without any, any trouble. So this is OK. This arrow is a morphism of coalgebras. But now, how about this arrow? There is another arrow which ne where we need to prove that it's a, morph that it's a morphism of coalgebras. So the second thing is that F. Q, 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 to F, Q, Q, F, Q, Q is a morphism of algebras. 
And why is it true? Or just imagine here in the end, that's a coalgebra, that's another coalgebra, and then you have them here. So why is it true that f of, no, but okay, that this stuff is a morphism of coalgebras? Does anybody know? Yes, so those people who actually looked at the exercises, they should know that this is, a, this is true because f is braided. So because. Being braided will imply that it's somehow that this co-monoidal structure on F actually is compatible with co-algebras. That when you take tensor product of two co-algebras and send it down to, to Fs of those, to tensor product of those Fs, then this really is a morphism of co-algebra because it's braided. Okay, so this was for verifying uh, that, uh, yeah, that this M is compatible with delta. Now, the, so far, frankly, all the simple structures appears to be totally useless. So it never appeared in this proof. And, uh, yeah. But for proving that, that this product is associative, th then it's somehow handy to, to use that, uh, to use that simple structure. But let me write it without that. So why is M associative? What is the idea? You know that M, uh, this M was obtained from really from FQQ going to FQQ like that when we take took identity epsilon identity and then somehow this became isomorphic to FQQ tensor FQQ. This guy was M. So how does one now prove that M is associative? We're going to use four Qs because between four Qs there are three kind of edges, and that's that's what's happening. So what we look at f of Q Q Q Q. How do we get to f Q Q? The ideology is really imagine those four Qs. Things are really happening on those edges. And then we go to single edge, and we imagine to take the product of all of those three edges. How do we get it? We erase those two inner vertices. It, okay, that's one of those face maps, one of those things which happen in the simplish world, but let me just write it down like this, that we erase those two middle things. So it's identity, tensor, epsilon, tensor, epsilon, tensor, identity. And the statement is that this map actually is the either way of taking the product of three things. So this stuff now, say, this is going to be isomorphic with F, Q, Q, F, Q, Q, F, Q, Q. Do you know how to do it? We need to apply coproduct on this side, then split it, and coproduct on this side, and then split it. So it's like apply the coproduct here. And that's the isomorphism which is written here. And since this, since this is an isomorphism, then we actually have a map going that way. And the statement is that this, this is either way of taking the, either taking first m times m here and then, then like that. So this is equal to m composed with uh, identity tensor m 
but also with uh, M composed with M tensor identity. But both of either doing like that or doing like that will give you the same stuff. And why is it? Because it just doesn't matter whether you apply first this epsilon or first that epsilon. You can do it in any way. Uh, but uh, as I said, to, to make this proof somehow neat and to understand what's happening here, then it's good to use that simplicial structure, to, to use the, those simplicial objects. So I leave it uh, as it is, just to say that you can verify directly, it's not terribly difficult, that, that this thing is equal to both of those, that, that stuff, and therefore M is associative. Uh, okay, I should, we should have a break, so, but before that, uh, one should still verify the unit. That, that seems to be uh, silly enough that I just say there is an exercise. And the antipode, that would be a nice exercise, but let me do it after the break. Okay, so let's verify that the antipode is an antipode. So what was S was F of beta Q Q. And let's see whether it is uh, indeed an antipode. So what, what, what is actually, what is the meaning of an antipode? So if you have a bi algebra, I should probably use some other color because it's not the same, okay, or some other thing, but I will not. So it means that when you take the coproduct, then you apply the antipode. So there's this S thingy, either here or there. It, it should be true for, for both sides. And then when you, after that, you take the product. So this stuff should be the same as applying the co-unit and then, uh, then just taking the unit and doing that. So let's try to verify this thing. On our would be Hopf algebra, which is F. The coproduct in, in that stuff, well, which is the coproduct in QQ Q, Q, finally. So we would do this. That. And now on one of those sides, either here or there, so let me do it. Here, as it's, as it's drawn, we apply this beta thing. Do this antipode, <coughs> or suggested antipode. So we apply that thing. So this is what, what happened up to here. Then I should also, uh, I should put it also under that F, so it would possibly be something. Not sure whether it's helpful, that F thingy, probably not. But somehow this is what's roughly what's happening. And then we need to take the product and verify whether this is true. Uh, but now you see, uh, this thingy somehow is from behind. Now it returns there. So what you see here, is, uh, would be the same as there is this thing and then we just go behind and do this. That braiding probably had some meaning. It had the meaning that we can just pull it, pull it up like that. Okay, but now we need to apply that product. And the product was defined in this horror way. So what was the horror way of, of defining the product? So let's, uh, let's recall what was M. The idea was to take <coughs> F, Q, 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 apply the co-unit in the middle, go to F, Q, Q, 
And this stuff was isomorphic to FQQ, tensor FQQ, but how did it go? It went by first doing the co-product FQQQQ, and then using the commonoidal structure on F, FQQ, FQQ. And this was the, uh, this is an isomorphism this and this is M. Okay, so let me draw also that F thingy. So F is this. F goes now like that. But fortunately, those two things that you see here, that's exactly what's actually happening here. You see, here we have three Qs. Then we apply the coproduct, and then we apply this commonoidal structure on F. Okay, so if you use the isomorphism, so now using the iso F Q Q F Q Q. Q, Q, Q. So this diagram. What does it become? I just want, instead of landing in FQQ tensor FQQ, I want to land in FQQQ. So this is FQQ, FQQ. But it, I just want to land, land there. So what is it now? It is just a simply This, that, and this, and this F is just uh, not doing anything. It's only lying here outside. So that's when we simply well, when we apply the isomorphism between this and that, and we go go from this diagram to this diagram. So now we're going from F Q Q to F. Q, Q, Q. But what should we do to, ap to apply that product? We should apply, we should now go from here to F, Q, Q by taking identity, tensor, epsilon, tensor, identity. Very well. So what does it do? Applying that thing, we'll, we'll just do, we just need to apply epsilon here. So we get that thing. Now we apply here, it's epsilon, I can retract it back here. So now we're really going from FQQ to F. Q. And that's it. This is now, let me maybe pull it a little bit further apart. So what's happening here? I can do it in stages. So we do this, then we do that. So at this moment, it's still FQQ. Here in the middle is just F of Q. And here is again FQQ. So I just, I just split the, the morphism into two morphisms. One is going here, and the other is going, going like that. Do you recognize this morphism? That's what's happening when you just apply delta on Q. Maybe you don't, but it was the unit. Unit. And who's that guy? That's, this is the co-unit. Well, when we identify this FQ with one, this is really what, what is the co-unit. This is what we wanted to show as the end of the proof.
Okay, cool. Now, let's look at first some two silly examples and finally at some the real example. So for that, I would for D, I would, no, okay, let's start with it. D is a group. D is the category of G sets, which is a symmetric monoidal category. You can imagine that. The tensor product is defined as just simply as the product, and the, the action is the diagonal. With the diagonal. Now for Q, I will take G, where G acting on H is GH. The thing uh, for F of the set, I'll take X mod G. I should probably write it on, or should I write it on the other side? It, I mean, th those are left actions, so depending on what you, how you prefer. So that thing, is it a, uh, so first of all, is it a symmetric commonoidal or whatever, or, co or braided commonoidal in this case, everything is symmetric? Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't say wh where it lands. Okay. So I should say who is C? C is just set. And F is that, that guy. So F is a commonoidal. So we should I should say what is F? Uh, from X times Y, how it goes to F of X times F of Y. But it's simply the, the, the nature of the only possible map of going from x times y modulo g to x mod g times y mod g. It's just the projection. Everything's OK. Now, is it uh, this uh, q admissible thingy or g admissible? So is it true that, so anyway, what, what is f of x times g times y? So this is our q. So it's x times g times y modulo g. But whatever the action of g is on x and y, we can always naturally identify this simply with x times y. And how does it go? It's simply the, the identification is that uh, x and y here is sent here to the class of, uh, of x, 1, and y. Just because, well, right, or because it's true. Right? There, is no, there is no explanation here. And so this implies that certainly implies it's, it's all, this all should be just trivial. So this certainly implies that uh, okay, the F is G. So what does it mean that F X G Y, this all always this product, is isomorphic to F X G times F G Y simply because all of these are, sim are just X times Y. Yeah, there is, the, doesn't sound very deep, right? And it's not supposed to sound very deep. So this should imply that F of G times G of algebra in sets. And which Hopf algebra, is it true? So what is it? 
just, well, f of g times g is simply g. That was this identification where you have here g1 and g2. You send it to uh, g1 inverse g2. I just repeat, basically, now we'll just repeat the motivation for why we were ever talking about this stuff. It is, it is a group, namely the group G. Well, if you, with the, the coproduct is for anything in sets, as was one of those exercises, always just the diagonal map. So the interesting part is only the product. And from here, you get the product in the group itself. Uh, did we achieve anything? No, because we already started with the group itself. Then we did something unspeakable to it. And <laughs> recovered the group back. So at least we might be happy that uh, we didn't do anything really bad, that things are back to, to normal. Uh, so let me now tell you the same example, just in a more algebraic fashion. So when instead of a group, we will be talking about enveloping algebra of a Lie algebra. But it's really the same thing. Another example. So we start with a Lie algebra. Now for D, we take the category of, of representations of this of this Lie algebra. For C, we take vector spaces. For Q. Q is going to be the enveloping algebra of, of G. So it's like some, some sort of formal algebra, whatever version of, of a group that we, we just talked about, the uh, enveloping algebras of, of the algebra. Uh, F of X, X is now a vector space, a representation of, uh, of G. That's going to be X mod G on X or G coin variance, if you wish. Now, is it admissible? Or there, again, it's the same stuff that F admissible because or F of X tensor UG tensor Y is just simply as vector space is isomorphic with X tensor Y. And how does it go? It goes by taking X tensor Y here and sending it to the class of X tensor 1 tensor Y. the same story as, as on the other blackboard. This should imply that f of ug times of ug is a hot algebra in, in vector spaces. And which Hopf algebra? Well, it's UG. Again, we, uh, we didn't do anything there, so we're not supposed to do anything here. It's just exactly the same thing, but now put in this world of vector spaces, but so namely, so we, I, I can identify this with UG by saying, saying that uh, whatever, uh, 
x here is mapped there to the class of one tensor x, or to, to use that uh, notation of g1 inverse, etc. Uh, one can also say that uh, if we have a x tensor y here, then I would map it there, the same, same thing to, not to one, but to s of x, the antipode of x, x times y. Okay, so that's the identification, it's just the identification that we have over there. So this is of algebra, namely namely UG. Nothing happened here. But now let's just modify a little bit this example to, to finally prove a theorem. which says, roughly speaking, one can quantize Levi algebras. Namely, so if uh, G bracket, co-bracket is a Lee by algebra, say, over some K of uh, characteristic zero, Then one can deform the, the Hopf algebra, Hopf algebra UG in the di direction given by, given by delta. So then there, is, there exists a Hopf algebra structure on UG in the category vect h bar, in category of, uh, vect, uh, just to rem maybe you don't remember, this vect h bar, it, it's simply the category of vector spaces, but where now morphisms are allowed to depend, uh, allowed to be power series in h bar. That's the only difference. So uh, I want to have the product and coproduct to depend formally on some, on some parameter called h bar, so that's why I put it here. Uh, so the Hopf algebra structure on UG, namely that we have this UG, and then there is a product, coproduct, antipode, unit, and co-unit, such that MH bar is equal to M, M0, sorry, plus O of h bar squared. So uh, the product is, is deformed, is changed only in the second power of h bar. This is the original product. Uh, probably I should write it somewhere, but I'll write it soon. So, but I'll, now I'll tell you that this is the original product in UG. And now this delta h bar is already different in first order of h bar, namely by the delta. To, to write it in a nice way, I would probably write it for a Lie algebra element. So delta h bar of x is equal to one tensor x plus x tensor one plus h bar divided by two delta of x plus o h bar squared or all. For all x who are in G, so one, it's a part of your G.
and here well, it's m0 m0 delta 0 s0 are the usual usual product or coproduct antipode in uh, new g and those one and and epsilon are the original and are not deformed Antipode is deformed. It, uh, now it would just follow from general nonsense that that antipode is equal to S zero and plus some terms. Of, there is already a term which is uh, linear in H bar, and if I'm very mean, I can put it as an exercise to, to uh, even to compute what, what is not just this first order term, but but that this guy is something very simple. It doesn't contain any associate or anything like that. Okay, but one can deform it. There is such a deformation. The, their theorem is then somewhat more precise. It says that uh, this deformation is given by uh, some universal formulas. So there is actually formula for what is this, formula for what is that. Uh, so I will not state it that way, but, but it will be apparent from the proof. We'll just be proving in, such, in a universal way. So how does one prove it? How to construct Hopf algebras, so we just need to apply that construction in some particular case. So let me set up the categories. So first of all, it will be I'll call it D zero. This will be U D modules. D is the, U is the double. Of G, so this guy is an infinitesimally braided monoidal category. That's not yet our braided category C, D, but you now it should be clear who is that, that guy. D is going to be the corresponding braided monoidal category. U, D, mod H bar 5. So we need to pick up an associator. So we pick it up and use it. Now C zero say will be vector spaces and C will be just vector spaces with those with that formal parameter H bar. Now who's who? Uh, this Q thingy. I remember that D zero and and D, they have the same objects, right? It's the, it's the same thing. They don't really have the same morphisms because here the morphisms are allowed to depend on H bar, but they basically have the same morphisms. It's, it's only in that, uh, in the braiding and in the changing of, uh, uh, of parentheses where, where this thing is really different from that, that guy. So we need to say who is, who is Q as an object in, uh, in D0. I should probably write objects. These objects of. So we need to find some something here, and so this Q will be U G. But to make this work, I need to persuade U G to be a rep representation of D. So it's going to be U G uh, with the usual. Co-product and co-unit. So this guy is an enveloping algebra of a real algebra, therefore it certainly has a co-product and co-unit. This stuff should be an I co-commutative 
coalgebra. I already tell you what it is as a coalgebra. But I still didn't tell you how it is an object. So U G as a representation of of D. How do we do it? It's already it's analogous to analogous to when I said that G can be seen at least locally as D mod G star. But that's exactly what's going to happen except that I'm going to replace this G by, by UG, by the formal neighborhood of unity, if you wish. So the idea is that we can identify UG with UD modulo UD times G star. That's what's happening here, because that works. Why does it work, or what is the thing behind it? If you imagine that you can go from UG times UG star to UD by taking the product by M0. So this is an isomorphism of vector spaces. Is it okay? It's like Poincare Birkhoff with theorem, or one, one consequence of that. That we can just move everybody in G to the left and everybody in G star to the right. Say we choose a basis of D such that it starts with the basis of D and of G and ends with the basis of G star or something like that, or whomever. So this is an isomorphism. And now so I'll write every element of of D in this form as somebody from here times somebody from there. And if I just now kill anybody who has a trailing G star, that, that means precisely killing that stuff. Okay, so that's one explanation of what, of what's happening here. So this makes that makes UG to an object in zero, and in fact, to a coalgebra. Just because this uh, UD is a coalgebra, it inherits the coalgebra structure. It's the same coalgebra structure as there. No, nothing strange happening here. Okay. Delta on UD commutes with the, the action. And the delta on that guy is compatible with the delta on, on this guy. Or it comes from, if you do it. Now, what do we need to do? So certainly, okay, now, now we know that that gives us that who uh, U G is a commutative coag in the D zero. But we okay. But what we need, we need to make it to we need to verify that it's I co commutative. Or so it's co commutative. So what is there to be verified? It sort of happened in the last exercise session, but it was slowly decaying, I guess. So let me let me write what it, what we need to verify. That okay, we start with this U G. Now apply the coproduct. Standard, nice coproduct in U G. And then we, we act with T, and we want this to be zero. In other words, we want somehow uh, delta of x and T acting here to be zero. 
for every x in ug. That's what we want to prove or what we need to verify. How does one verify it? So it's it's enough to verify it for x equal to 1. Why is it so? Because you can get from 1 to any, anything here, right? You can get any x here by, by action from somebody from UD. By, by action from whom of UD? By action of x from UD. That's the easiest way how to do it. Right? So it's enough to verify it for this simple thing. So what is now the equation? So what we need is that T acting on 1 tensor 1 is 0. And why is it so? Because this T is equal to EI tensor EI plus EI tensor EI. So T acting on 1 tensor 1. What's going to be? EI acting on 1 tensor EI acting on 1 plus EI acting on 1 tensor EI acting on 1. Now, this is not really needed, but, but right now, I'm acting from somebody from G on this one. So this, this guy is simply equal to EI as an element in G which sits in UG. But what is important that this guy is 0. See? Because I'm acting, th that's, here I'm finally using the, how this action is defined because I identified this with that guy and I know how to act here. So let me start with 1. I, act, I multiply, simply multiply with somebody from G star, but the guy is here. I kill it. The poor guy didn't survive, so the thing is 0. This is 0, and this stuff is 0, so it's 0. Perfect. Everything works. But this is just a version of the, we, you see, we already once verified that the algebra of functions on, on G is I commutative in this world, in the category of UD modules. This is the same stuff, only now for done for co-algebras more algebraically. But okay, we did it again, no problem, it's fine. So this certainly, well, okay, this implies certainly that this Q in G is a co-commutative -co co-algebra in, in D when we finally applied the associator. It was infinitesimally co-commutative, stays co-commutative after we apply the associator. I should tell you what, who is F, that's going to be easier. It's the guy that we already saw. So F going from, or it goes from these, uh, uh, okay, goes from D to, to C. So these are just vector spaces, and these are the representations. So F of D is the one that we already saw, the, uh, the G coinvariance. Very well. Now here we already verified or convinced ourselves, or I, I told you or something, that, that certainly, first of all, uh, what should I say probably? F is I, uh, braided homonoidal functor. This implies that F, F is commonal functor from D0 to C0. That implies F is a braided commonoidal from D to C, that's fine. And finally, F is Q <coughs> admissible. That we already, th this part you already saw in some uh, slightly different context that it, F kills exactly one copy of UG. Okay. 
So this should mean that f of qq And that's our Hopf algebra. Here we have it. So what is that guy? That's UG tensor UG and modulo G, or modulo the action of G. Now exactly. As before, I identify this space, this vector space with UG as a vector space. We saw of is the isomorphism that we saw. We can identify this with uh, with UG. How how did it go? It's say by saying that one, sorry that x in here. Is mapped here into the class of one tensor x. So this guy. So now this this stuff is a oops, algebra in vector h bar. Now certainly, mod, if we discard h bar, the modulo. Modulo h bar is the example that we already saw. Right? Modulo h bar, there is nothing happening. Modulo h bar, we get the usual, the standard. So C, the previous. Let me try to finish it. So the fact that, that the product is deformed only in h bar squared, it comes from the fact that the associator contains things only in h bar squared. So I'll, this I may leave it up, say, for the moment as undisclosed, uh, or up to you or something. But let's now verify to see that delta of, of x, h bar of x, is equal to 1 tensor x plus x tensor 1 plus h bar divided by 2 delta of x. Let's try to compute this. So how does one compute it? So first of all, what is the D of one tensor x? We're using this identification, right? I take one tensor x sitting in Q tensor Q. So what is the coproduct here? Let's just look at the definition. What should we do? We start with one tensor x. Now we apply the coproduct here. Apply the coproduct here. Let's work on modulo h bar squared. Modulo h bar squared, there are no associators appearing, so we don't need to care about any stupid bracketings. But there is braiding appearing right here. So, uh, so what is it? We get either, if you discard h bar, then, then we get one tensor one, that's what's coming from here, and from here we, can, we get either one tensor x or x tensor one. Tensor one tensor x plus 
1 tensor x, tensor 1, tensor 1. And finally, there is this thing appearing uh, which will only come when, when there is x and 1 crossing. So there would be h bar divided by 2, as it should be. There is h bar divided by 2 of, right? So imagine that in the end you get like x and 1, 1 coming here of 1 tensor t acting on x tensor 1. Tensor 1. So we need to compute who that guy is. So it's plus O H plus K. We need to compute this guy. T of X tensor 1. As I told you, the T is E I E I plus E I E I. That guy will kill one. So EI acting on one is equal to zero. So this term doesn't contribute. It's only this term that contributes. So it's EI acting on X tensor EI. Uh, will you kill me if I still continue for two minutes? Oh, probably yes, but that will not stop me. <laughs> So now I should write it as, you see, this now written in sort of a wrong order. There is uh, somebody from G star and somebody from G. So let me like, exchange it to, to write it in the sort of the correct order so that I can uh, remove things from uh, G star. So for that thing, I can write it is the same as if I take the bracket, E i x tensor E i. You see why? Because the, the other thing in the bracket, the other thing, which is like x times ei, that's that zero mo the modulo, modulo that something over times h star. So that's why I can, I can do it. And, and now I would actually like to project it only to simply to ug. So let me take only the, the g part of the thing. So the g. But I discard also the, like that, that thing, be, this thing belongs in principle to, to D, but I, I discard the part belonging to G star because it's zero, this module thing. And we need to compute that stuff. Wow, so this, this belongs into G tensor G. Can we compute it? So I'm going to contract it with some alpha tensor beta who is in G star tensor G, uh, tensor G star. So you see, if I contract EI with, with, with beta, the thing that, that will happen is just that this will be re replaced by beta. So we get, we get beta on X. Now say the G part of that, but I'm going to anyway contract it with A, sorry, with alpha, alpha comma. Okay. So this is, this is the outcome of contraction with alpha and beta. So this is what we were once upon a time, we were drawing it in this way, that there is alpha, beta x, it is in this order. And this stuff, so that, that's the, okay. Uh, that's the Lie bracket in D, contracted with everybody like that. And this stuff is nothing but minus delta of x contracted with alpha tensor beta. It's minus because here alpha and beta are exchanged. And that's the end of the story. I'm sorry for taking so long. So what did you get? We, we go to one tensor, one tensor, 
1 times 0 x plus 1 times 0 x times 0 1 times 0 1 plus c minus x bar divided by 2 1 times 0 delta x times 0 1 but then we need to apply then we need to project to So it's like this. Now this goes through the middle. So how do we do it? Well, this this is simply one. This is one tensor x. That's x. This is one tensor x. That's x. And here is one tensor one. It goes to one. Here is minus whatever something x one tensor x two. The thing. So what, what will this do? This will just leave me x1 tensor. But you see here it's x2 tensor 1. It's not in the right, it's not in this nice order of 1 tensor or something. So how do I put it into this nice order? I need to I need to apply the antipode on that, the standard antipode on that guy, which will produce a sign, another sign minus. So that's why it will produce plus. And this is h bar divided by 2 times delta of x. And that's the end of the story. And sorry, yeah. But one can call it sort of end of this course or something. Though we shall probably still meet next week. But.